Thank you, David. Beulah Land. I shared with the men a bumper sticker that I seen uh, the other day I thought it was great. It said, Hunk, if you love Jesus, keep on texting if you want to meet him. <laughs> I think that's me. Also, uh, several of you know, keep asking me, how you doing, how you doing, how you doing? I thought, you know, back there I made it clearer. I didn't want to have to spell it out, you know, every time. But, hey, listen, <clears throat> some mornings when I wake up, I'm so excited. Man, I, you know, a new day, a new adventure, a new thing to do. On the other hand, there's some mornings that I wake up and I say, boy, I need coffee, and I need it quick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's on those mornings, by the way, when I know that God is there and I know God will help me. And I can depend upon Him and I can call on Him. So at, at this particular time, I'm just in a waiting period. And uh, how long that'll be? Well, ask the doctor. They'll tell you. <laughs> if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me <clears throat> to uh, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. I just want to read verses 1 through 3. 1 John chapter 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begetteth loveth him also that is begotten of him. But this we know that we have love, that we love the children of God whom we love when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to be here this morning to praise you, to sing praises unto your holy name, to give of our tithes and our offering, to lift our hearts and our voices in praise and prayer unto you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that this morning, if there is one here who has never truly accepted you as their personal Savior, that today they would open up their hearts and invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come in. Father, I pray too <clears throat> that those of us who are Christians will commit ourselves, dedicate ourselves to living for you and serving you and doing your will because what we do is certainly not grievous. It is a wonderful, glorious privilege <coughs> to live for you, to serve you, and to do your will. Lord God, I pray that each one of us will accept our responsibilities and do them to the very best of our ability, always giving you the glory that is due your name in whatever we do. Father, this morning, I pray that you'll speak through this, your servant, the words that you'd have me speak and help me to proclaim your word in a way that would bring other people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive me, Father, where I failed you so many times and in so many ways. Help me, Lord God, to do better in the days to come. I pray, I ask all this, in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake, amen. Well, it's interesting that everything in creation obeys the will of God except man. You know, <clears throat> the wind, the waves, all fulfill 
his will. Uh, the book of Jonah, by the way, tells us how all of these things obey his will. We see the storm and the wind and the waves and even the fish <laughs> obeying the will of God. But the prophet, well, he disobeys the will of God. Even a little plant obeys God. And the worm that crawls obeys God. But God's prophet disobeys God. And what a tragedy that is. What a tragedy it is that we disobey God in so many ways. But this morning, I want to talk to you about something different from that. Uh, it is also sad, really, so many people who claim to be God's children reluctantly, grudgingly, do the work of the Lord. This coming Wednesday night, or past Wednesday night, we voted in, the church voted in, several new people who will be serving in the new year, the coming year, to do certain things. You know, whatever it might be, serve on committees, work in the kitchen, all of these things, you know. But whatever it is that God has called you to do and you've signed up to do it, let me say this to you, dear friends. Do it with a cheerful heart. Do not do it grudgingly. We're not to obey Him out of fear. We obey God out of love. I believe that what Paul wrote in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 about giving, you remember what he said? He said, no, we're not to give grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I believe that God loves a cheerful worker. You know, when you uh, tell the Lord that you're going to do something, whatever it might be, it, just, it may be digging a ditch out here, it may be pulling weeds or whatever it might be, that you ought to do it and do it cheerfully, not grudgingly. If you're out there and you complain all the time about how bad it is and how come that group put me out here doing this and so on and so forth, well, I think you've missed what God has intended for you to do. I don't know. What is the secret of joyful obedience? <laughs> well, let me just share with you some things here this morning. First of all, it's a recognition that obedience is a family matter. You know what? We are serving a loving Heavenly Father. You know how much he loves him? God so loved this world that he sent his only begotten son into this world to die upon Calvary's cross for your sins and for my sins. Amen. We serve a loving father. But not only that, we have brothers and sisters who love him and who serve him and who want to do his will. It's a family affair. Whatever this church does, it's a family affair. We're all part, listen to it, we're all part of the family of God. Whatever we do, whatever we do, is to glorify God. And it's also to help our brothers and sisters in Christ that they might too do better. We demonstrate, listen, we demonstrate all this by love. He says here in the verses I read by keeping his commandments. You know, we, we, we keep God's commandments not just simply because, you know, we know them or we say them, but you've got to live it out. People have got to see you as you do that which God has called you to do. Reminds me of a woman who came to the, the editor of a local newspaper and uh, she wanted to sell him some poems that she had written. And he said, well, okay, read them to me. And the poems that she read to him were filled with moons and dunes and swoons and, you know, all that kind of stuff. The editor said to her, I'm sorry, but you really don't know what love is all about. 
And the lady was mystified. She said, well, tell me what it's about. He said, I'll tell you this. Love is not moonlight and roses. It's getting up in the middle of the night with a sick child. It's working extra hours so your kids can have shoes on their feet. It's sitting up with a friend all night long who's lonely and need help. It's going to the hospital and visiting people who are sick and who need help. And someone to pray for them. The world doesn't need your uh, poetic love. What this world needs, what this world really needs, is a good old-fashioned practical love that comes from Christian men and women who love God. Oh, how we need that today. Godly men and godly women who love God so much that they're willing to do what God has called upon them to do. And one of the things that we're to do, whatever it might be, we're to do it cheerfully. We show our love to God also, not by empty words, but by willing works. Now, you know something, we're not slaves. No one makes you do it. You don't have to do it, you know. <laughs> no one makes you do it. But obeying a master, you see, we, we are children. We, we're not uh, slaves who are being forced to do something. We are children who are willing to obey a loving Heavenly Father. You know, I might also say to you, sin is a family affair too. When a, by the way, when a Christian sins, you know what? It not only hurts them, it hurts God, it also hurts the family of God. Anytime that that play takes place. Another test of our maturity is our attitude toward God's Word. You know, uh, because God's Word, in God's Word, we find God's will for our lives. Now, I don't know what God's will is for your life. I do know this. If you promised God that you were going to do something for Him, then dear friend, <coughs> you made a commitment to God. You made a promise to God. <clears throat> then do it. And do it cheerfully. Now, I know what my will is. I know what God's will is for my life. And I try my best to do it. And do it with everything I got. And I try to do it cheerfully, happily. Not grudgingly. Now, <clears throat> I see some of you. I know what you're saying. Well, brother, you getting paid for it. <laughs> And because you're getting paid for it, you ought to smile about that big. All right, I agree with you. You got me. But that's not the reason I do it, dear friends. Amen. I tell you, I long, long in my ministry, many years ago, I worked for turnips. Really cabbage, potatoes, different thing. You know, some of those churches I pastored out there in Texas, they didn't have a lot of money. They had a lot of cattle. And they had a lot of land, but didn't have much money. Yeah. Interesting, they didn't really believe in paying the pastor. We had this one dear fellow, he thought, you know, bless his heart, I shouldn't say this, he was a good guy. But he had an orchard, and he had about a hundred pear trees, and he was absolutely 100% sure that he was going to pay his pastor in pears. <laughs> he brought me so many pears that the wife and I went downtown and we tried to give them. <laughs> that didn't work too good either. <laughs> Not too many people want pears, but hey. Whatever you're going to do, do it for the Lord, do it cheerfully, do it. That, you know. Now you do that because we know from God's Word what He wants us to do. It is from God's Word that you find God's will for your life. You know, an unsaved person 
you know, they don't, they find the Bible in, an impossible task. They don't want to read the Bible. First of all, they look at it as a history book. And most people do not like history. I don't know why. I loved it. Oh, yeah, me too. I, but they, they don't, you know. So they don't read it. By the way, the same thing happens to in, in mature Christians who find it hard. They're like little children who, you know, just learning to obey. And they ask the question, well, why should we do this? Or why should we do that? Or what's the purpose of all of this stuff, you see? Can we do it better? Can we find another way? Let, let me just share with you what a mature Christian does. A mature Christian enjoys reading the precious word of Almighty God. Amen. You know why? <laughs> he doesn't read it as, as a history book. He doesn't read it as a textbook. If you're one of God's children, my friend, you read it as a loving letter from your heavenly Father. Amen. It is God speaking to you from His Word. And you read it. And you take it into your heart. And you rejoice when you do, you see. You enjoy reading God's Word. You know, it's a love letter. It's a love letter from a heavenly Father. It's a love letter to His children. By the way, the psalmist, the 119th psalm is the longest psalm. It's also the longest chapter in the book. But you know what? In that psalm, he has so much to say about how much he loves God, how, how he enjoys God. Just listen to this. In verse 97, he says, Oh, how I love thy law, O oh Lord. How I love thy law, O Lord. Of course, that means the commandments. Verse 14, he says, I delight. I delight in the word of God. He even sings about it. Sings about the word of God, you see. <laughs> and if you love the Lord, you'll love his word. And you'll sing about it also. Yes. The first verse of that song, he says, Blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 16. Oh Lord, I will not forget your word. <laughs> Verse 47. I will delight myself in your commandments, O oh Lord. Everything, you see. Everything that he does, he delights himself in it. Because it is God's word. By the way, our text this morning says God's commandments are not grievous, they're troublesome right. to Him. You know, just as a loving son or a loving daughter is happy obeying their earthly father, how much more should a son or daughter obey their heavenly father? We ought to do it, you know. With, <laughs> we should do it with love. We should do it joyfully. We should do it to the very best of our ability. I, you know what? You know, I don't know about you and your earthly father, but, you know, my father died when I was 12 years old. I really didn't, you know, know it that well, what have you, just... But what I do remember was that I wanted to do what he asked me to do. I wanted to be obedient to him and all. But when I become a child of God and part of God's family, oh, listen to me. I wanted to serve him. I wanted to live for him. I wanted to be obedient to him. And I wanted to do it in a cheerful way. That's what we're to do. Third thing, you see, this kind of love is to be lived out in our daily lives. Every day of our lives, you know. <laughs> As our love for the Father matures, we have confidence. We have confidence in Him. We're no longer afraid of what it is that He wants us to do. You know, whatever it might be. 
We are also honest toward others and lose our fear of being rejected. We'll also have a new attitude toward the Word of God. We'll want to do what our Heavenly Father asks us to do. We want to do it in a loving way. We'll want to do it because we not only love God, but we, our Heavenly Father, but we love our brothers and sisters in Christ and we want to see them doing the very best that they can possibly do. You see, it's an expression of God's love and we enjoy obeying it. It's confidence in God. It's honesty toward others. And when we do that, we'll do it with all, with joyful obedience. You know, I don't know, you know, and the marks of, the marks of perfecting love, and all of this is part of an ingredient toward a happy life. I don't know, there are a lot of Christians who are absolutely miserable. You know why? Because, no, it's not because they, don't, they you know, don't really believe that God saved them and all that. It's because they really never caught on to what it is to be one of God's children and loving Him and serving Him and being obedient to Him and doing it joyfully. I don't know, but you do, if you're doing something, I, I don't know what it might be. But you're grievous about it. You complain about it all the time. Perhaps you need to stop in that and just ask the Lord, is this what you really want me to do? Is this how you want me to serve you? I don't know. You know, when we disobey God, we lose our confidence toward Him. You know, here's, here's the thing about it. If we do not immediately confess our sins, and claim his forgiveness. If we don't do that and do it immediately, we start pretending and in order to cover it up or whatever. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. They sinned, they knew it, and the first thing they want to do is hide from God. A lot of Christians, you know, they get upset. They're not doing what God called them to do. They're not being honest about it. They're not really giving it to all for the Lord. And many times, the way to get around that is to just simply drop out of church. By the way, disobedience leads to dishonesty. And both turn our hearts away from the Word of God and from God Himself. Instead, instead of reading the Word with joy, to discover whatever it is that God has for us to do. We ignore the Word of God and just simply forget whatever it is that God would have for us. You see. Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23, verse 4 says, A man trying to please God in his own strength is a grievous individual. Well, you know, a lot of people try to do it in their own strength. What listen to me? Whatever God has called you to do, He's going to give you. The Holy Spirit will help you to do it. And He wants you to do it, you see. By the way, that, that in the book of Matthew, the 11th chapter, verse 28, has an interesting verse of Scripture. He says the yoke, I don't know where you know what a yoke is or not, but it's put on oxen. A yoke uh, that Christ puts on you will be no burden at all. That's right. It'll be no burden at all. In other words, what Christ calls you to do, it's not going to be a burden. It's going to be a joy to do it. And that's what He wants each one of us to do. By the way, you know, I, I like Jacob. We've been in the uh, in, uh, book of Exodus and Genesis. We've been looking at Jacob. You know, Jacob, it says, work seven years for Rachel. Seven years! And he only thought it felt like a few days. It's interesting. He worked seven years for her, and it only felt like a few days, but he still didn't get her. Yeah. <laughs> he loved her. That's a reason it didn't seem like a long time. 
And if you love the Lord God, you'll serve Him, you'll do His will, and it won't be grievous, and it won't seem like a long time, and you'll just do it, and you'll be happy because you do it. <laughs> you know, being a obedient child of God, if you love God, you'll do His will, whatever it is He has for your life. You can't have a joyful obedience unless so you have truly been saved. That's right. And the only way to be saved, let me say this again, the only way to be saved is to be washed in the blood of the crucified Son of God. Mm -hmm. There is no other way. We looked at that this morning in our Sunday school lesson. You don't get to heaven by belonging to a church being baptized, belonging to a certain group of people or whatever it might be. The only way that you're saved is when you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In faith, believing. And He will save you. And then once you're saved, once you've become a child of His, you want to be obedient to Him. Whatever it is that he has called you to do, my dear Christian friend, do it joyfully. Don't do it grievously. Whatever it might be. Live for him. Serve him. And do it with a joyful heart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, my prayer this morning, first of all, is if there is one here who has never accepted you as their personal Savior, that today they will open up their hearts and invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come in. And the very moment they do that, you'll save them. And then they'll be in the very center of your will. And whatever it is that you have for them to do, they can do it and do it with joy. But many Christians, once that experience is over with, they begin to find excuses for not truly serving God and doing God's will. And many who will do it, but they complain about it. It's grievous to them. It hurts them to do it. Oh, God, help us not to ever come to that place. Help us to be joyful with you. Help us to whatever we do to praise you, to thank you, and to be joyful in doing it. Lord, my prayer is that your wonderful, precious will will be done in every heart that is gathered here today. And we pray, we ask all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.